So, so my name's Kim Carter. Um, I work as a consultant. Uh, I do a bit of uh, software and network engineering, penetration testing. Um, I, I do quite a bit of setting up and optimising uh, cross-functional, self-motivating uh, uh, development teams. Um, certified Scrum Master. Uh, I co-organise a couple of the information security conferences in New Zealand, um, the Kwasha Shaker Conference and the OWASP New Zealand Day. Uh, so we've got a good contingent down here of the Kwasha Shaker Con organisers. Um, I'm a software engineering radio um, a podcast host and I'm authoring a book series, a three-part book series. Uh, the first two uh, books are done, uh, they're weighing in at 800 pages, um, so there's quite a bit of content in there. Um, so they focus on um, improving the security stature of development teams um, and, and lifting team performance and helping us to create uh, predict, uh, predictable releases and um, helping us to um, yeah, uh, create maintainable and, exi and extensible code and ideally um, minimising surprises. So the context of this talk is in the processes and practices chapter of the first book of my um, series. So some context to set the stage. So in the first book there's a 30,000 foot view chapter. In this chapter we discuss a sensible security model which is um, uh, which was created by Bruce Schneier. Uh, we discussed the flow of it. Uh, we discussed setting up um, a development team or purple team, so basically a development team that knows how to defend itself and attack itself, uh, so that's all part of the development life cycle. Um, and yeah, so uh, the sensible security model basically is, a f um, there's five steps of uh, really simple threat modeling. So it basically discusses our assets, our risks to those assets, countermeasures um, to the risks, the risks of the chosen solution, and then costs and trade-offs. And then we take uh, what we've learned from the 30, oh yeah, also in the 30,000 foot view chapter, the whole idea is to get the developers to um, get their heads out of the code and to step right back and to base, yeah, so that they can see the entire uh, security landscape. And then we take what we've learned from that and, um, and start to hone down on uh, specific areas in the next chapter, which is a 10,000 foot view. And then after that, we've got a tooling chapter, which we um, uh, set up a, a, a penetration testing distro. Uh, I have focused on Kali Linux. Um, we add a bunch of extra tools, and we um, configure some of the existing tools in there. And then we uh, move into the processes and practices section, uh, chapter. So in this uh, processes and practices chapter, there's two subsections. Um, this, uh, the first one's are focused on the attackers, and the second one's focused on um, basically your development team and are taking the lessons we've learnt from the attackers and applying them to the development team. And then we move on to all the topic chapters. There's two topic chapters in the first book. Uh, the first one's physical and then people. Uh, so in all of the topic chapters, we apply the sensible security model. And then the second book uh, uh, covers VPS, network, cloud and web applications. And the third book, which I haven't yet started, is going to be covering mobile and IoT. Uh, also, that's the URL for it. Uh, you can read it online for free, or you can download it and pay for it. So I've seen a lot of organisations uh, hire code monkeys rather than professionals. So organisations reward those that complete features the fastest, thus rewarding technical debt, which in turn slows the professional developer down, because they can't help themselves fixing and simplifying it. Managers see that uh, code monkeys are pumping out features and see decreasing levels of productivity from professional developer due to the increased workload, refactoring and simplifying code monkeys code. Professional developer researches their approach rather than copy pasting from Stack Overflow, which again takes longer. Professional developers creating maintainable, extensible code of far greater quality than code monkey, but it's unseen from those outside of the development team. So sprint review rolls around, new features added on top of professional developers' code and a new features added on top of CodeMonkey's code. Sprint review rolls around again, stakeholders are happy with the features added on top of professional developers' code, but they're starting to notice buggy behaviour in the features that are added on top of CodeMonkey's code and it's becoming um, harder and more time consuming to fix them. So this trend continues to worsen. 
So why would CodeMonkey change when they're being rewarded for the way they work? So Scrum, without the additional processes and practices that I'm going to show you, exacerbates this. So while a professional developer seems to be slowing the team down, and clearly CodeMonkey appears as a rock star and delivers his features much faster, the actual truth is the opposite. Sustainability is a key uh, principle of the Agile Manifesto. If we reward the behaviour that creates it, we create a vacuum for professional developers. So we're going to work through a uh, selection of processes and practices that were birthed out of uh, my own trial and error as a consultant, often called in to help struggling teams with their own performance and security issues. So there's a caveat here. Um, some of these secrets uh, you may be doing already, but in order to get the maximum benefits, you really need to be doing all of them. And, and as you start to do them all, you'll probably discover um, others as well. So let's break some mindsets. So how do we do this? So remember at the start when I gave some context? My first book covers um, a chapter called Processes and Practices, which has the two subsections. First goes through how the attackers think and work, uh, their, uh, the, basically their life cycle. Um, and the second is a collection of learnings taken from the attackers, but for the software engineers. So in my book I discuss the attackers, also known as the red team, um, both black hat and white hat, how they think, how they attack their processes and a sequence of events, and their tooling and techniques. So I took what I could from the red team and created a set of development related processes and practices. So the, we then apply these development related processes and practices to your scrum team, also known as the blue team or uh, defending team. And this is um, essentially what empowers them. So, so this produces a development team that's capable of delivering the sprint increment with security baked in. So at the very beginning of the book, we discuss uh, the specialities and required in the dev team uh, to, to basically establish a purple team. So you've got a selection of um, people in your scrum team and they, ha um, and they need to have different specialities in order to create a successful uh, purple team. At least one of the team members needs to have an attacker's mindset and be capable enough of uh, producing attack sequences. And this is often the security champion, which we'll discuss soon. So we bring the security focus from the most expensive place in the software development lifecycle, uh, often retrofitted at the end of the project, to the least expensive place, which is within the sprint, and we make it as part of our def definition of done. So we augment uh, your scrum process with security-focused processes and practices. So on the right, oh, we've got our scrum events, artifacts, and transparency. Um, and most of the developers in here doing um, scrum will have seen these. On the left is the additional security-focused processes and practices uh, that we add. So by doing this, we drastically reduce the cost of finding not just security defects, but all defects. So this is the average cost of fixing defects based on when they're introduced versus when they're detected. Putting the practices that's finding the defects in the right order can reduce costs, uh, can reduce the cost of defects by up to 100 times. So what you see there is if you find a, um, a requirements defect in the requirements stage, so you're essentially finding and fixing it as it's introduced, it's got a certain cost. So if that same uh, defect is not found and fixed until the architecture stage, it's going to cost you three times as much to do so. And as you can see all the way through to post-release where it's going to cost you 10 to 100 times as much just to fix the defect that could have been fixed when it was introduced. And the same sort of thing applies for architecture and construction. Um, construction's a little bit less, but still uh, fairly big numbers. Detect faults at the stage with the least time consuming and costly to correct. This is just a, a graph of the same thing. OK, so you might be thinking this sounds like madness. So what can we use uh, to find the process of fixing defects and uh, make it cheaper? So just before we dive into the process and practices, remember we need to use the sensible security model as defined in the um, book's first chapter. So the idea here is that um, a a the developer can, t uh, can take the book and apply it to their, 
uh, to the way they work and uh, to their teams. So here we create a time box team exercise in which we identify and write down the assets for your organisation. Then we create a time box team exercise again because that's what scrum teams do. And we identify and write down risks uh, to the assets uh, you just identified. At this point you'll be starting to know your assets and understand the risks to them. Then we create countermeasure product backlog items. So countermeasure PBIs are like any other PBI. They're estimatable, independent, testable, they should promote collaboration and they must fit within a sprint by the time they're properly groomed. Your countermeasure product backlog items also need to reference the risk that they are created due to, thus providing a context and urgency information. Countermeasure product backlog items are then integrated into your uh, usual product backlog and ordered based on the risk ratings. And that's discussed in the first chapter, um, basically how you go about doing that. So th uh, the FET modelling uh, becomes part of your sprint process. Now the following are some of the processes and practices I've found that when used together within scrum teams can become a game changer. So first up is establish a security champion. So a security champion is a bit like a scrum master in that they're a servant leader and a mentor but with the relevant security skills. They must be a team member, so part of the development team and not be external like part of a security team and coming into the development team to help. So the idea is to find someone that really enjoys technical challenges and let them pull the role on them rather than pushing the role on because mandating roles doesn't work so well. So the security champion will be able to bring change to within the development team and the organisation. Handcraft or penetration testing. So this is costly when performed late in the cycle but many times cheaper when performed within each sprint. This, the security champion can also help um, other team members upskill on that sort of thing and myself and other security professionals can help uh, train the champions. So there's lots of guidance on how to do this in my book. There's also a BSIM, OWASP, Microsoft and Intel have a lot of guidance on this. Uh, peer programming. So two brains on your code is not just twice as good as one, especially when one has a security focus. Code reviews. You can augment your usual code review process with the likes of JS lending tools as part of your uh, build and source control pre-commit if you're not already doing this. And there's a collection of static and dynamic analysis tools that I've uh, listed in my book that you can automate as well. Now we cover techniques for asserting uh, discipline in inherently undisciplined languages such as JavaScript. We cover flow and TypeScript. Um, and this gives us static type checking, which is the implementation of design by contract, also known as DBC. Uh, the D is um, the D in the SOLID acronym. Uh, we can measure cyclomatic complexity and reward those who reduce it. And then we move on to the consuming free and open source. So this is in the, uh, in the web applications chapter in my book. Uh, this is addressed by OWASP A9 of the top 10 uh, using components with known vulnerabilities. So this is often not thoroughly tested or reviewed. It's often created by amateurs that can and do introduce vulnerabilities. And it's also an, attack, an effective attack vector for getting an attacker's malware into others' working systems. And it doesn't undergo the same requirements analysis, defining of scope, uh, acceptance criteria, test conditions and sign-off uh, that our commercial software does. And some countermeasures on that. Also, um, uh, Debbie Edwards from IBM um, had an excellent podcast around uh, uh, setting up a, uh, a team that, a committee that would uh, basically look after the white list of um, external dependencies within a um, company or organisation. And um, the idea there is that each development team uh, really needs to have a person from that committee within the team so that when they're working away within their sprints and they get roadblocked, uh, well, the idea is that they don't get roadblocked. So uh, when they need to um, call in a dependency and, uh, and they realise it's not on the whitelist already, uh, they can get that specific 
person to talk to the committee or whatever and get it fast tracked, uh, get it put in the whitelist or something else. Find someone out. Find something else that's going to do the same sort of job, rather than getting, rather than than blocking the team. Um, so there's automated um, processes uh, uh, that you could run over your uh, code base as well to check that no libraries are used uh, that are in the whitelist, and other simple initiatives like downloading and reviewing packages before running them. Uh, there's npm show to check for npm hooks and being careful of doppelganger packages. Uh, don't install Node.js the official way, piping arbitrary scripts directly from the internet to your root shells asking for trouble. Uh, the tooling landscape's starting to fill out. We've got npm outdated, npm check, David, which uses your package.json and provides um, a GitHub badge informing you of out of date packages. We've got retired.js which has been around for quite a while. You can run that as part of your continuous integration. It's got a Chrome and a Firefox extension, a grunt and a gulp in our task, a burp and a zap plugin, and an online scanner. We've got the Node Security Platform, also known as NSP, which has a CLI, a gulp task, a code climate engine, and GitHub pull request integration. And we've got Snyke, which has a similar feature set to NSP with a few extras and a slightly larger price tag. And there's some others. So when you usually run your test condition workshop, when the developer pulls, uh, pulls a product backlog item into work in progress, you start thinking about what types of testing are going to be most suitable. And developers create test conditions. So we've got given wins and ends for any of you that aren't familiar with these. These are basically, yeah, so you'll have one or two developers, developers that will pull a uh, sprint backlog item into work in progress and then they'll sit around and uh, create some test conditions. Your givens are your initial state, uh, your wins are changes to that initial state, usually made by users, and your expected outcomes are, the, are your thens. They uh, pretty much help um, as we're uh, developing our software as uh, specifications too, they work quite well for that, and you can automate them. Uh, and we also create evil test conditions. So basically just the same, just with a security focus. And the idea there is that if the developers are struggling to come up with um, attack scenarios, because often developers do, uh, that's where the security champion comes in and can, and can lead the rest of the developers by hand and teach them how to think um, offensively. And after a while that does rub off. Uh, test conditions lead into TDD, BDD perfectly. Evil test conditions lead into security focused. TDD, BDD, just the same. So TDD, test driven development, inherently fo um, uh, creates testable code. The testable code is not about testing, it's about loosely coupled um, designs. Uh, it should be easy to maintain, uh, it, it helps us to uh, to create a code that is easy to maintain. Uh, streamlines continuous delivery, allows us to make changes faster with confidence. If it's hard, it forces us to evaluate why it's hard and thus I reduce the code complexity. And inherently forces us to embrace many good architectural principles and all with the added benefit of driving out security defects iteratively as the code's being written. And then we can uh, throw that into our continuous integration, which provides another continuous security check. Uh, measure test speed and reward those who create fast running tests. Now traditionally penetration testing and security in general is often uh, are thought about at the end of a project, unbelievably often once the solution is delivered. And imagine if this was done with any other form of QA. So what you've got here is you've got um, security defects um, being created by developers, and it could be uh, weeks, um, days, weeks, months, even years in some cases uh, before those defects are found. And for a developer to get back to that uh, point um, to be able to uh, actually fix the defect, it can take several days often to unwind the architecture and all the code and uh, work out what other areas are going to be affected by the changes that they make and also to build up the context in their heads. So that's why it's so expensive there. So by converting that effort into something that can be used in parallel with development, 
we significantly reduce the costs and lift the quality. So having a solid purple team, that's a development team with the security focus, is far more effective than, um, than penetration testing at the end of a project. So this all sounds great, right? But how do we do this? So this brings us to um, security regression testing with Zap, API and NodeGo. This is a um, proof of concept that I did about, about 18 months ago. Um, and have since gone on to uh, do something more elaborate for um, a large international client. And it's worked out really well for them. So what we've got here, uh, remembering that just, uh, this is just a proof of concept. I'm going to show you some proof of concept code and a demo. Uh, so we've got two uh, projects. They're both OWASP projects. So most of us are aware of Zap. Um, it's just an HTTP intercepting proxy with a large collection of known defects and exploits for those defects. It also has a RESTful API that we can use to program against. Um, and we've got uh, NodeGoat, which is a purposely vulnerable node web application. It comes with a set of tutorials, covers the OWASP top 10, and it's got, um, it's got fixes in the code that are commented out um, in quite a few places. And it also comes with videos on how some of the attacks can be played out. So I just took um, a node goat as the system under test and um, put a code, so I put a test in there to um, test the profile route, and this was part of the proof of concept. Uh, also, um, yeah, so uh, my second block, uh, book is now complete, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and take this proof of concept and uh, turn it into something a little bit more uh, consumable so that we can actually just, um, the idea is that we can just consume it and do some configurations and get uh, some sec security regression testing running over um, our code bases uh, without doing all the work that I have had, um, have had to have done. Uh, Zap can be run headless as well. Uh, there's also a Docker image for it, and I set up a Docker, a Docker image for NodeGoat as well, so you can have those running quite easily together. And the idea here is, uh, is that you put them into a nightly build, so developers introduce a defect today, they come in tomorrow, and they're told that they've introduced a defect rather than waiting weeks, months, years, until they find out that they've got a defect because a penetration test has found stupid mistakes that we as developers should have, uh, shouldn't have put there in the first place. So I'm just going to show you some um, code. Can everyone see that? Cool. Uh, so we've got the, uh, on the mouse. No. so this is Zap Target app here. Um, this is just our, our system under test. It's just made up of the HTTP uh, SUP protocol, the config.host name, which is wherever it's running from in the port. Uh, then we've got the uh, Zap, uh, the Zap, uh, Zap Target app, which is made up of yeah, similarly. Um, the system under test protocol plus the uh, config dot zap host name. So basically, uh, what I'm saying here is, um, is that either of them can be running pretty much well anywhere. Uh, we've got some uh, uh, Selenium code here. Uh, this is proof of concept code. It doesn't need to be here. It's just to get up and running um, for this POC. You can do. Um, all the proxying through Zap uh, programmatically without Selenium, but it, yeah, this is POC code. Um, so um, uh, this is the profile route, so what we're doing is we're going to be proxying this first request uh, through Zap, and it, uh, you'll see soon that it'll build up the sites tree over here when I actually run this. And we're just filling out these fields with these values. Uh, and we've got a alert threshold. Yep. So this alert threshold here. So we've got a hypothetical scenario. Um, a development team's taken on a brownfields project. Uh, it's got three defects baked into it currently. We want a passing test when we start, and then they can st uh, start to whittle away on those defects uh, once they get moving. Uh, we've got a uh, we've got a clean up. We've got some clean up code there. Yeah. So this is just uh, uh, written using the mocker uh, test framework. Um, obviously JavaScript, uh, we create a new session once we're finished. Uh, this is uh, mostly so that you can actually see what's happening 
because uh, I use this for, de um, uh, for workshops and that sort of thing. We also use the Zap Proxy uh, client. Uh, so there's, uh, there's a handful of clients uh, for different languages that are supported, so you can just use the client to talk to the Zap API. Um, then we've got, yes, yeah, so the most important parts in this are sync.series, if you can focus on the green function names. They pretty much tell you what's happening. Uh, so we do a bit of spidering there. We set an authentication uh, method, and yeah, this set logged an indicator, I think, is a visual thing. Set forced user mode basically means uh, when Zap comes across an area uh, or a route that needs to, it needs authentication to access, it forces Zap to um, log in, and then we supply the credentials down here. And then we kick into the active scan. So uh, the active scan is quite a high level scan. Uh, yep, so what we do is we um, run this active scan. Oh, a couple of minutes. And yep, so this stuff here is just polling. This tells us how far through the scan we are. And, and then we just uh, write um, our results out using that proxy core.html report, so it generates the report for us. So let's run this now, and I'll just talk it through. So I've got the Zap UI there, and NodeGoat's going to be, uh, you'll see it there. So we're uh, just reseed, reseeding NodeGoat's database here to a known state. And starting node, uh, are the NodeGoat. And just ran grunt test security, did we? No, we're about to. Yeah, so that's just Selenium there logging in and it's going to go to the profile route and send some parameters through there and then we're into the active scan. And now Zap's active scanning the node application. Uh, it gave us some feedback across there. You, you won't have a UI in a nightly build, uh, so we get feedback in the uh, terminal as well. And so the developers introduced some defects. This tells us what's actually happening. Uh, about to write the report, uh, and then it says writing report two. Tells us where the report is, and it says search the generated report for the pro, uh, for profile to see the seven vulnerabilities that exceeded the user-defined threshold of three. So if we open that report, this shows us what those, it shows us what the attacks uh, were, it shows us the parameters, it shows us the URL, gives us all the evidence we need in order to uh, find where that defect is and to reproduce it. And there's our um, existing 3D fix. So I'm just going to, um, yeah, there's some information on there if you want to use the POC on how to fix your cross-site scripting defects. So I'm just going to fast forward there. Okay, so we've uh, reseeded the database. Run the app again. Run the test. Yeah, the idea here is that um, the developer comes in the next morning, sees the defects, and here, um, here's the passing uh, result. Sees the defects, reads the report, knows exactly where to go to to fix the defects, and then uh, runs it again, and we have a passing result. So that's that. Yeah, and in there uh, we see just our existing three defects that we had when we took over the uh, brownfields. Uh, project. Oh. Yep. So how to set up and um, how to use is on my GitHub and in my book. Uh, I don't think we've got time for questions, um, but if anyone has any questions, oh, do we? Do we have time for questions? No. No time for questions. If anyone's got any questions, come and see me afterwards. Cheers.